right, welcome back. I'm Gary Parr, and you are listening to Fiber Talk, the twice weekly podcast for needlework artists. And my artist guest this week is Cindy Young from Luhu Stitches. Hi, Cindy. Hi. Good to have you with us. Yeah, this is uh, we met uh, in the Nashville there. So, yep. Yes. Yes. Yes, we did. Yeah, we'll have to talk <laughs> about that a little bit. Um, this show brought to us by Fire Poppies, firepoppies.com. Uh, check that all out, uh, Susan Winter. Now, remember, she is a US, U.S. distributor for the Lowry Stands. So if you're looking for a stand and you're looking at the Lowry Stands, uh, Susan at Fire Poppies is your place to go. She has the stands and the accessories. And then uh, uh, also the Coming to America project with Brenda Gervais. That uh, that thing, that thing, <laughs> that project uh, is, uh, she has that. And then if you like really interesting and creative character caricatures characters whatever check out uh amy Bruken's 365 days of warm woolly welcomes that's a fun piece so that's worth checking out and then of course uh the uh, sweet land of liberty re-release chart from blackbird designs also available at fire poppies and then if you want to participate in the uh royal garden stitch along that von and i are doing starting july 5 uh, Susan has kits, threads, charts, so she can help you out with that and uh, get you going so you're ready to go on July 5 to stitch that with us. And um, so firepoppies.com or just call Susan and she'll fix you up. All right, Cindy, we met in the we met in the Nashville, got yes. to see your work and said, all right, we got to talk more. So yes. you're, you're one of those fun people who is pretty much a lifelong artist then. I, yeah, I am <laughs> probably since I was, could hold a crayon. Yeah. Cause see, it's, yeah. it's, you get designers, needlework designers who do needlework and then start designing and kind of have an art talent and then things just come together for them. And then we tend to, then we get artists who then end up doing needlework, which I think is an interesting, interesting way to go. Uh, you know, so when I, when I hear artist, how do you get from artist to needleworker? And so you, so you did artwork all through school? Yeah. I mean, that was always my proclivity was art. And I, you know, my favorite part of any classroom day was if we got to do drawing or crafts or anything like that. And I always, you know, I was always doing crafty things at home. Um, you know, I grew up, I'm a child of the seventies. So salt dough was a big deal. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and, you know, I can remember making little Christmas ornaments and painting them. And, um, I think my mom pretty much bought me my own flour and salt so that I could make my own dough for a while. Leave, leave me alone. Make your own stuff. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we need to eat. Stop, stop using my flour. Um, <laughs> You know, so always there were paints and crayons and anything I, well, not anything I wanted, but, you know, anything my mom could get for me, she would, you know, I remember there being felt, I remember making felt ornaments with all the little doodads and shiny things on them and, um, you know, so yeah, my whole life and then, um, and I was always, you know, I kind of grew up in the days of school where they routed you in certain directions. Right. So uh -huh. I was always kind of put with the artsy teacher and, um, yeah. And, and, you know, that, that was always my, just my favorite part of school was more so than you, recess. Did, did you continue art after high school? Um, no. <laughs> Okay. I mean, I was always doing things on my own, but yeah. it wasn't what I originally, I, you know, I went to college and that wasn't what I started. I was going to be a teacher, an English teacher. There we go. <laughs> and hey, former, um, former science teacher. It's, it's all right. <laughs> yeah, whatever. <laughs> I was going to teach. I mean, and um, I, I, I wasn't aware of graphic design per se. Mm -hmm. Somehow I got through high school and nobody told me, well, this is how you can make money as an artist. <laughs> Although 
not necessarily. But in college, yeah. I found yeah. out about graphic design. So someone and... will someone will pay you for the work, but <laughs> make money. Right. It might be another level. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> um, and so I. I got into, I went to California State University, Chico, and they have had a communications department and under that umbrella had a graphic design program. Mm -hmm. And that's where I ended up and loved every minute of that. (laughs) So then, then that would have been really before computerized design came along. Right. I was right on the cusp Uh of, of computer design literally there was so this would have been mid 80s Mm -hmm. there was one computer design class and it had 20 slots yeah and i can't remember how many people were in the graphic design program but i never got a slot (laughs) so fortunately i got a um, internship with the associated student body Mm -hmm. and they had Macs. Yeah. The old Macintosh. Do you remember those are black and white screen? Oh yeah. And the hard, it was all the screen, the hard drive and everything was one piece of equipment. And so I got to play around with that a little bit. And then, um, but all of my training was really, old school. It was, I took a marker rendering class. Uh I took a photography class. I took a lettering, how to, how to create your own font type of class. I Uh took typography where you actually manipulate the letters by hand and, you know, and, and if you wanted type, you had to go to the typesetter to get the type, you know? So it was, I, I missed out on computerized graphic design training probably by a a year or two yeah yeah see that was that that period of time see was my early years in in as a magazine editor right and so our artists our magazine artists were working their way through that same process trans you know making the transition from conventional print photos and and yeah i mean Mm-hmm. A typeset and all of that to computerize things. And right. one of our one of our artists had a side job, which I think he made a ton more money doing that than he did working <laughs> for the magazine. Uh, but he worked for the magazine for the healthcare because he had kids. But he he was an airbrush artist, and oh, uh, yeah. he had a gig doing uh, the tabletops for Bally uh, pinball machines. He would cool. he would do those and uh, all of that art. Wow. And, and and so he would work during the day as a magazine artist. And then the next day he'd come in and he's just blurry eyed because he'd been up all night airbrushing Bally tabletops. Well, you know, he was make it was worth it to make, you know, he was yeah. making a ton of money doing that. But then he started, uh, he had to learn uh, computerized graphic arts because that's where Bally was going. Right. And, and so I remember that transition. So you were caught right in that same that same time period there. Yeah. Right. Right. And unfortunately, when I graduated from college, I was not able to get a design job before I got married. Oh, <laughs> so I never got like kind of on the job training. Mm-hmm. And cause you know, probably within the first year that we were married, my husband works in um, resource management and you know, natural resource management. He's uh-huh. a forester. Oh, okay. <laughs> and we moved to a rural area. Well, there's not a call <laughs> for graphic designers. Yeah. Particularly, you know. Yeah. That cuts you right out of the picture. Yep. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. But, you know, it was all for the good, but it was kind of like, oh, well, so much for that. <laughs> sort of, kind of. <laughs> yeah. So, but, but you still, you, I mean, obviously you're a maker of things, so you still, yes. So must've kept that going in some way then. Yeah. So we moved, um, to Northern California and into this rural environment and 
Um, it was now we're up to the early nineties when kind of the craft show mm. thing was big and people were making, you know, making was more of a deal and people would yeah. go to a big craft show to see all the different handmade items. And I got, um, sort of suckered into toll painting at that point. And, um, basically my sister-in-law handed me a blank dollar horse that my father-in-law had carved. And she said, would you paint this for me? <laughs> and I'm like, okay, I don't even know what a dollar horse is. Yeah. So I don't I'm either. What's a dollar? What is a dollar? So, horse? <laughs> uh, have you gone to Ikea? Has, have you gone to Ikea? Uh, only and to get out red... of it. <laughs> <laughs> The red wooden horses that have a traditional folk art painting on it are oh. they're sweet sweet this sometimes called Swedish horses. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. 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 So my husband's family is Swedish, and anyway, so she handed this stuff to me and said, "Can you paint it for me?" And I'm like, "Oh, I don't know." So lots of research ensued before the internet, and um. I, that's how I got kind of suckered into toll painting and I found out I really liked it. And, um, the local fabric store had some craft classes going on and there was someone teaching toll painting there. And so then I, that kind of morphed into a little craft business for a short time for a couple of years. So, and so you, so you kept, had, you had the booth at the craft fairs, that routine? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Did that for a couple of years before we had kids oh. and, um, pretty early on realized that, um, this is not how you make money. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that, the, that the people making money, not that my whole creative world was about making money, but just, um, that, you know, there was sort of like, you're trying to figure out how do I use this skill that I have mm -hmm. to help support my family? And, and it, you know, my husband and I realized, well, we're breaking even on this, but yeah, <laughs> you know, really what we're doing is supporting a hobby. We're not Right. contributing toward our finances right. particularly. Yeah. I've never seen yeah. how those craft fairs were profitable. All I could ever conclude was it was people who had a lot of idle time and then yeah. had more idle time on weekends to go sell what they made during their idle time during the week. Cause there just yeah. is no way if you figure out the per hour uh, no. money that it works, it just doesn't work. No, because yeah. people aren't going to buy what it's really right. worth hour. If you were to put an hourly, cost on it so my takeaway from that time was make patterns uh, and let other people paint this stuff mm -hmm. and then i had a had a baby so oh yeah that <laughs> <laughs> that that yeah yeah so then um any kind of more career-minded making or crafting was put on hold yep and it went into the hobby category. Yeah. So, but I was cross stitching at this time also. Oh, okay. So, so, so you, so that's where the cross stitching comes in was you'd at least pick that up in that period there. Yeah. So my mom was always into, I mean, uh, I, I need to back up a little bit. So my mom, when I was talking about my childhood and crafting and making things, she was always doing stuff. I mean, she was learning, she was teaching herself to crochet. She was teaching herself to do cruel embroidery. She was teaching herself to sew. She sewed clothes for us. Um, and, you know, she was always doing and making and figuring things out herself. Um, and she was very drawn toward textiles mm -hmm. and, uh, so long about the mid eighties when I was in graphic design school and too cool for school, she was getting into counter cross stitch <laughs> and she tried at that time to get me into counter cross stitch. And I'm like, no, <laughs> that's like, you know, housewife stuff. Right. And, 
I'm a graphic designer. Yeah. yeah. And <laughs> I'm a much anyway, higher level than that. Yes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, anyhow, but after I got married and we moved to this rural area and I was a, you know, I was a newlywed new wife. I was suddenly interested in all the home arts and found this pattern in better homes and gardens and I, my mom was coming up for a visit and I showed it to her. I said, I want to learn how to do this. I think she was probably over the moon. <laughs> she was so excited. Finally, I can teach her how to do count and cross stitch. Uh -huh. <laughs> and so we went to the, I don't remember where we went and got our DMC, but we found DMC and some Ada cloth and um, she got me all set up and I was hooked. <laughs> <laughs> from then on so she got yeah. you <laughs> she got me finally you know and it was a barbed hook it wasn't you know yeah. a barbless hook so. <laughs> uh, well that yeah well and uh, you know that for any any mother who does that kind of stuff to have your daughter actually have an interest and pick it up that's yeah that's got to be pretty exciting yes yeah yeah my my daughter just texted me the other day and said is there a sewing machine around somewhere oh no and i'm like oh, she wants to sew i'm so excited <laughs> oh boy yeah how, and how old is she she is she will be 19 oh okay in just a couple weeks here so um she suddenly ha she is in a graphic design program at southern oregon university and she has suddenly decided she wants to learn how to sew all right. Boy, this is this is so. a genetic thing and the, the a woman genetic thing in the family here. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. My sister is a quilter. Oh. And uh yeah. So well, you guys has her You guys have some fun at the holidays then. Oh yeah. The men just go watch football and we yeah. <laughs> we yeah. do our crafty thing. Yeah, so. go leave us alone, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So then exactly. then how does the when does the art and the and the cross stitch come together to start making designs. Well, I think probably right in that whole crafting period of my life. Um, I was of course getting cross stitch magazines, you know, and one of my favorites was put out by leisure arts for the love of cross stitch. I don't mm -hmm. know if you remember that one, Oh yeah, yeah. but they would run um, contests you know, they would give a subject matter or something like that and say, you know, design something around a song and send it into us. And if you win, you get this and you, you know, the pattern would be published. Um, so I designed the stuff, but never got it finished and um, had it sitting here. So I had started designing way back in the early 90s oh. when I was doing my toll painting and um, was actually in court. I had incorporated some cross stitch with some toll painting and, um, and sold it at my <laughs> little craft booth <laughs> and uh, for, for zero profit <laughs> for zero profit. And um, yeah, so that's where the design started. Um, I think children got in the way, um, you well, know, once yeah. the kids started arriving, it was sort of like I needed to put all of that stuff on the back burner Yeah. and not that I wasn't cross stitching. It was actually much easier to cross stitch and have small children around than it was to paint. <laughs> mm, yes. So, yes, you know, not a lot less likely to have little thing, fingerprints of, paint around if it's not there to begin with so right right yeah yeah well that you know and that's the the thing as as a mother with cross stitch or actually with any needlework is you can use that to fill those times when you're waiting to pick up or uh you know at the yeah. baseball practice or any number of things it, it comes in as a handy little thing yeah right right Exactly. Yeah. Sitting in the car. I might as well do something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Precisely. Yep. And heaven knows I've done a lot of that. Yeah. So, so then you have the, all right, this is just a real 
nice evolution for you into design. Yes. Yeah. It kind of married those two, the painting, crafting side of things with the graphic design. Mm -hmm. um, so designing on a grid for needlework is like the, I, it's right up a graphic designer's alley. Right. Because you're already thinking in terms of uh, grids anyway. Right. When you're graphic designing, you know, you're, you're thinking about placement and you're thinking about positive and negative space. And really you're just taking all of that and applying it to needle and thread and fabric. Yeah. Yeah. And, Cause that's your, that's your ground cloth. It doesn't matter what the actual material is. That's your ground cloth is, is a, a grid. Yes. So you're yes, not even a difficult transition for you. No. no. No, no, it was really, it was, it was perfect, <laughs> probably <laughs> pretty perfect. And, and it also made me feel good, you know, like having to put all of that on the back burner for 15, 16 years, feeling like, oh, okay, my college education was worth something, mm. you yeah. know, I've been able to now apply it. Yeah. Not where I expected to, but in a way that is fulfilling and um, probably better than I hoped for. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. And so the um, uh, as the kids get older then, do, do you start to haul it out and work on it? Or is it just some point <laughs> where, all right, now I have enough free time, I can actually devote some, I can, I can do something for me. <laughs> Yeah, um, actually, probably about so I homeschooled our kids, and probably about five years ago. Ooh, tip, tip of the cap for that! Holy smokes! Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I, I, with my oldest, I feel like I deserved every bit of that tip. So, <laughs> um, so about five years ago, my husband says, "So what's next?" Because our son had graduated from high school, our middle child, daughter, who's now in college, was just starting high school, and we had decided with our youngest that she would attend a, a small private Christian school here in town, and he said, so what's next? And I had to mull that over. I probably mulled that over for a good year, um, you know, just as we transitioned right. from full-time, full-on homeschooling to something a, a lot less intense. And um, well, I, w I would have taken a good year. Yeah. To, yeah. Because <laughs> that homeschooling, oh, man, that's hard. It got to be harder on the parents than the kids. That's uh, <laughs> Some days. I yeah. mean, you know, I I had this, I literally worked on one project and it's still not done. I had a little bag that I took with me if we were going anywhere in the car and I would stitch on that little project and I, it's still not done. And I've been stitching on it probably for 20 years. And, <laughs> um, but, uh, a lot of my creative energies went into, you know, planning schedules and curriculum and, yeah. and, and teaching and, and all of that. So, right. uh, you know, it took a while to shift gears from homeschooling mom to cross stitch designing mom. <laughs> oh yeah. I'm sure there was a, a, just a period where you just got to flush your brain. Um, yeah, yeah, no, that's yeah. the, that's the thing that you know, people say, cause I, I, I taught for a few years and, uh, you know, people like well, teachers, you know, they only have to work nine months and blah, 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 blah. <laughs> And I, I say to every one of them, I say to every one of them, all right, if that's what you think, then you go stand in front of a classroom of 25 or 30 kids yeah. five days a week for nine months of the year, and then you come back and talk to me. But until then, yeah. I can't hear you because uh, right. you have, I mean, you have to be a performer, an educator, uh, creative artist, all of it. Yep, all of it. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So yeah, don't, well, e I, don't even tell me. I don't want to hear about it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The job that's helped pay the bills for the cross stitch business is this, I substitute teach. So I know exactly what you're talking about. Yep. Uh -huh. yeah. 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 No, I, I don't listen to anybody. Don't tell me about teachers. 
The, yeah. Because uh, you can, I always say, you can always tell the teacher at a basketball game because he or she is sitting on the top row of the bleachers grading papers because they're yeah. on supervision duty that night and the papers have to get graded. And so that's a little look into what their home life is like. So, uh, right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. No. Right. Don't tell yeah, me about teachers. <laughs> yeah, it's not eight to three and no. nine months out of the year. No, no. no. <laughs> so around the clock for nine months of the year and then three yeah. months to regain your sanity and start over. <laughs> right, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yep. So, yep. so you still substitute teaching. Wow. That's, well, uh... not for the last couple months, but. <laughs> oh, well, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but yes, I, I keep it down to probably just one day a week and. It's a good outlet for mm-hmm. me. Yeah. Um, you know, and it keeps me motivated to come back and do designing too, because, you know, you have those great days when you go in and substitute teach and <laughs> the kids are great. And then you have those days and you're like, I really don't want to keep doing this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That, yeah. There's your motivation right there. That's the yeah. kick in the butt. Yep. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I want to make enough money at this so I don't have to substitute teach. Anyway. <laughs> yeah. So, so you start designing, uh, is, is it, you, do you make a conscious decision that I'm going yes. to start designing? Okay. Yes, I, I did. I had this little idea for, uh, my first design was the little Luhu bird with the knit cap and the earmuffs. And that was my first idea. And I drew it out, got my grid paper out <laughs> And put it on there and started stitching it just to see how it would go. Because I, while I had been stitching through the years, I hadn't been keeping up necessarily with what was going on in the cross stitch and needlework industry. Uh And so I had no idea. I knew there was Etsy. What had happened in the meantime was Etsy. And that, opened up all kinds of new opportunities for getting designs out there. So I thought, well, okay, if I'm going to do this, I got to, you know, figure out what it is I'm designing. Right. (laughs) And I just, uh, I went back and revisited some of those designs that I did for the contests. And um, I have one of those in my Etsy shop. And then okay, so so they weren't so bad then, huh? No, I I actually I don't think so. I got the rainbow upside down on one, (laughs) but other than that, (laughs) uh, other than that, um, yeah, I was able to use a couple of stuff that I had designed years ago. See, that's pretty neat because um, I'm always curious about that. You know, as a designer, do you go back to your first designs and go, "Oh, what was I thinking?" Or did you really have something going there? And it sounds like you had something going. That's great. Yeah, I mean, I think I did. So that was kind of nice that I didn't, I didn't look at it and go, oh, way outdated. Yeah, exactly. I went looked at it and went, it needed a little tweaking, mm-hmm. but I felt like, you know, it's worth the effort. Yep. I'm going to take this and go with it. Yeah. yeah. So where does and the, Lu- the, where does the Luhu part come from? What Help me with that. So my name's Cindy. And when I was um, in college, one of my roommates just started calling me Cindy Luhu. And, <laughs> you know, kind of based on, you know, we had, you know, my generation, we all grew up watching The Grinch Who Stole Christmas you know, the cartoon version. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, that's where she got it. And then, you know, I had a nickname, you know, we all had nicknames for each other. Mine just happened to be Cindy Lou who, and when I sat down, I was like, okay, now I'm designing cross stitch again. What am I going to call this business? Yeah. And my husband kind of said, well, what about your name? You know? And I'm like, Oh, I don't know. Cindy young, Cindy young. Yeah. And then I remembered my nickname, Luhu, and I thought, okay, I think we can do something here. Yep. And I sat down and started writing it out, and the traditional spelling wasn't working for me. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I just went phonetically and came up with the L-U-H-U, and um, 
that's that's kind of the thought process behind yeah. the Luhu. Well, yeah. so now you have a unique name. Yeah, that's. I hope so. Yeah. yeah, it certainly generates conversation. I can't tell you how many times at Nashville people ask me, "Where did you get Luhu from?" Right. Yeah. <laughs> yep. So. No, oh, that's great. So then this, yeah. so then you, you say, all right, I've got, I've got something going with my original designs Did you build off of that. Or did you have over the years, a whole bunch of other things stored up in your head that just had to spill out? Uh, yes, all of that. Okay. <laughs> so I did, I did go kind of with, um, some of those older designs to help kind of get things going. And then I started, um, just looking at old sketches and then creating new sketches and uh, I'm doing, you know, kind of looking also at some of my inspiration artists and seeing, you know, what do I want to draw from here? And, you know, what kind of a aesthetic do I want? I'm, you know, and I'm still working on that, but what, what are the things that I love you know, about cross stitch, about yeah. design, um, that I want to bring to the table essentially. And, and that's kind of the thought process there it was, and, and I just started putting stuff out. I mean, the great thing about Etsy and a PDF download is there's kind of zero risk, right? You yep. know, you can, create a design, put it together and upload it onto Etsy and just see what happens. Yep. And, um, and I did that for a couple of years. So, yeah, that's the, yeah. that's where uh, you, you and I are in the same boat in, in that we got to see from old school graphic arts and paper and mm -hmm. all those things all the way through to today where, everything's electronic and you have these outlets that living in Northern California, you wouldn't right. normally have. And, and right. you have a way to get yourself in the market without having to move or travel to do it. Yeah. Yeah, precisely. I mean, it's like, wow, what happened in the last 20 years? That was amazing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, so. and that's just it. If you're smart enough to latch onto it, you can really, uh, use it to your advantage and yeah so many people oh that's too much for me and oh i you know i don't want to do that and uh, no you latch onto that and ride it because it's there for you yeah right well and i think part of that early experience um with going to craft shows and um when you you know one thing about those is that there becomes sort of this carny kind of <laughs> carnival like <laughs> person who they're at every craft show and you're like when do you have time to even create yeah because you're traveling from craft show to craft show right. and they all know each other and you know and if you're like i was who you know just this kind of a housewifey uh -huh. <laughs> person who's just trying to make a little extra money on the side you know you're not going to be involved in that part of the right the scene so yeah when Etsy comes along and the internet and everything like that, it's like, Whoa, this is great. I don't have to travel. Right. Yeah. <laughs> no more craft fairs for me. <laughs> right. Yep. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. There, there's gotta be a social element to those things that draws people. That's yeah. yeah. Because there's no money to be made and there's an incredible amount of time and travel. And it's got to be, yeah. it's got to be that club thing that develops that makes it worth it, I yes. guess. Yeah. I guess. I, I wasn't into that, so. <laughs> not, not my cup of tea, yeah. I guarantee It wasn't that. my cup of tea, no. <laughs> I had so much fun. You mentioned about your, your artists that you like. And I had, I actually, in getting ready for this, spent some time looking them up because I remembered Richard Scarry. Yes. From uh, reading books to our kids. Yes. And so that one, that name, I, I knew immediately what kind of artwork that was, even though I went back and looked at it. But the others, uh, and Charlie Harper, I know from Needlepoint, painted Needlepoint canvases. Right. Uh, so that one I knew. But the other two were, were Mary Blair and Joan Anglin. Joan Walsh Anglin, yeah. yeah. Boy, those, so were, Mar those were fun. 
<laughs> right. Well, and Mary Blair was kind of like the uns. You you see her work in Disney, but you nobody knows who she is. Mm -hmm. You know, she did a lot of development in Cinderella and Sleeping Beauty, and um, of course, probably for me, her her most her biggest thing that she did for Disney was it's a small world. And for me as a child, her art, when I realized who she was and I went, Oh, well that was all my favorite artwork as a kid, <laughs> you know, her color combinations, her palettes, her shapes mm -hmm. and her, the way she laid things out so it you get this sense of flatness, but three dimensionality at the same time. Mm -hmm. And it, you know, my favorite ride at Disneyland to this day, and my family kind of they'll go on it with me once, but I my husband will go with me twice, and then after that I have to go by myself. Is it's a small world, <laughs> and I don't go for the song because admittedly, oh, that song do not get that song in my head. No, no, not Sorry, that. No. I won't. <laughs> It'll drive you nuts, but I could It never look. goes away. <laughs> no. I know. It's what I call one of those worm songs. It worms its way into yep. your head. Um, but the I could look. I could just look at the artwork forever, probably. Uh -huh. <laughs> I love it. And particularly her original designs. They've kind of brought in, you know, characters from different Disney movies yeah. in her sort of design style into the ride, but I like the old, like her original stuff. Mm -hmm. I, you know, it's just, it's an, it's incredibly inspiring for me. And, so so um, of the four, and, of the four, she's the one that's at the core for you then. Yeah, she really is. Yeah. Um, I think Charlie Harper is kind of in that same kind of category. It's like, this looks really simple, but it's not. Mm -hmm. It's sort of, it's more intricate. And then I think with Richard Scarry and Joan Walsh, Walsh England, they, they impart a sort of feeling and coziness that I want to bring into my work, yeah. you know? Um, so between the four of them, but they're all, you know, artists that before I knew who they were, I enjoyed their work. Yeah. Yeah. You know? It was just so. a, a style that that connected with you, right? Right, yeah. and it's it is sort of a mid century modernist uh, illustration style, you know. Mm -hmm. So I mean, it kind of makes sense. That's I'm a mid century kid, so. <laughs> well, but there's there's a, a timeless element to it too. Yes, I mean, like Richard Scarry's stuff works today as well as it did thirty years ago. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it doesn't get dated. No, that's and that's what no. like Charlie Charlie Harper Harper stuff. I mean, people today still latch onto his stuff for uh, um, uh, needlework all the time. Right, yeah. and there's uh, because I go to quilt shows with my sister. There's uh, somebody who's um, making quilt patterns. Oh, you based on his work as well and his wife's work. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Um, you know, and yeah, it's, there's something, you're right. There's something timeless about it Yeah, that I think carries through. Yeah. It was, it was an interesting set of four. And, <laughs> uh, I, and because normally I would not, uh, have taken the time, but, uh, because I knew, I knew Richard scary just from raising kids, it's pretty hard not to. Right. Yeah, uh, you know, you're a real blockhead if you miss that. <laughs> yeah, <I'm not> <laughs> but then it was all right. Now I gotta, I gotta go on this little journey and see who these others are, and see what they yeah. do. And uh, yeah, you owe me a couple hours of my life. But um, <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> no, but was it was, adorable. it was fun. It was fun because you could yeah. see. And then I went and looked at your work, and I could see the influences. But then with your own mm. twist. And yeah, yeah. It was, so it, it was well, fun good. for me to piece it together. Well, good. Yeah. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Yeah, yeah I did. <laughs> good. You still owe me two hours, but I enjoyed it. 
Tell you what, next Nashville, I'll buy you a drink. Okay. 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 You're on. <laughs> so then you take that and then, then talk about your colors. Talk about how you handle colors. Is that also influenced from that? Or do you just have your own kind of little world of color palettes? Um, you know, I, I saw that you gave me that list to kind of think about. And I thought, okay, how do I, cause color is extremely important to me. Um, I've thought about what would happen if I couldn't see color. I hear about colorblind people and I'm like, Oh, I feel so sorry for you. <laughs> um, cause I think from a young age, my earliest memories probably involve color and bright colors and, um, you know, those sort of translucent pinks and blues and greens and um, that kind of make my heart sing. And um, so when I sit down, I sometimes think, okay, I want to do something more delicate, more muted. And I can't. It's like my my pencil won't go there. Yeah. To... Um, that I mean, not that you don't use shades of color, but my my I want to apply the color. I want the color to be inspiring mm-hmm. and um, to render a feeling in the person who's looking at it. Mm-hmm. Um, you know. Which is why sometimes I wish I could make myself go more pastel (laughs) because, you know, maybe I want to, you know, give a more peaceful feeling. You know, I kind of think of the impressionist painters like Monet and Renoir who, you know, use actually very muted colors, but vibrant at the same time. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you think about Monet's water lilies and... I was blessed to be able to see a portion of the panels of the, of the Monet water lilies at the Museum of Modern Art in New York one time and sit, it's a room, you sit in a room with these paintings and, you know, your first impression is pastels and muted, but it's not, it's a vibrant color and you're surrounded by it. And, I think for me, when I'm designing, I need to um, really use that mm-hmm. and let that out of out of my pencil or my paintbrush or my needle. And so even when I go and just pick out threads at random, I, I go for the brights. I go for the bright pastels and the bright. You know, not neon. I'm not really into neon. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, more vibrant colors. And so I think that that informs my color palette a lot. And um, I also, you know, kind of being a new housewife in the early 80s when mauve and country blue were in, <laughs> you know, yeah. and geese, you know, I try to avoid stuff like that. I want something that. I don't want to grade down color. Right. Unless it's going to help a brighter color shine. Yeah, and see and I see that in your designs. Yeah, you 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 have that one or two bright colors and then you you support it with the, the more muted stuff consistently. Yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. yeah, and and I also think it's really important to um use black or a dark color when I'm designing to anchor the design. Mm -hmm. Um, There's sort of a principle in interior design is that you want something black in the room so that your room doesn't feel like it's floating away. And um, I think that principle kind of carries through in other forms of artwork as well. Um, You want, you want that to, you know, artwork to be, balanced I think Mm -hmm. and I think that's where having a dark color versus some really bright colors comes in yeah well and that's I mean that's a a kind of a 
overriding principle everywhere I know in, in my photography efforts, you know, that when you're, yeah. when you're processing images, where's mm-hmm. the black, find, find the dead black and make sure it stays black. Yeah. Don't let it gray out because you, then you, yeah, you lose your depth. Right. And, yep. Right. And, and right. find your white, but don't blow it out. Yeah. Yeah, yep. exactly. Exactly. And I think that's why, <laughs> I think that's why it's hard to photograph needlework sometimes. Mm -hmm. Yes. You know, so. Well, uh, that's, you know, that, that's that principle you learn in photography because back, back in the day when you learn photography, the instruction from any veteran was go shoot black and white, develop it and print it. Yeah. If if you can come up with, uh, if you can come up with a good black and white image consistently, then you have it. Right. Because because if you try color, you it, color your your mind will compensate all day long with color, but right when when it's not there, and your image is alive, then you you've got you have it you found it and then yes. you, then you build off of that then you can add color and do it in uh, uh, intelligently and yeah. and make it work but you still have right. those principles that are underlying yes. Yeah. So when I was in school, we, I had to take a color class and you learn, you learn the color wheel and, and then you learn about hue and you learn about value. And interestingly enough, we started out with a value, which is from blackest black to whitest white. Mm -hmm. And then you, like you were saying, then you apply the color. Yeah. You know, yeah, it creates the boundary, and, right. and and you have the depth, and then you now what's going to go in the middle here that's going to make it come make it work? Yes, right, exactly, yeah. exactly. Yep. So I think all of that, what we've been talking about, really informs my design, mm-hmm. and um, that color class that I just mentioned was probably the most important co- class for me when I was in school. And I'm kind of sad my daughter doesn't have to take one (laughs) because I feel like that helps you grasp when you're laying something out in a design that helps you understand the difference between um, white space and dark space, negative space and positive space. Mm -hmm. And and then you can apply your color to help balance things out. And I think there are people who have an innate ability to do that. And I think a lot of artists do before they get training. Mm -hmm. But when you understand it, when you've, I feel like because I've had the training, it's given me a little um, bit of, it, it just helps me, um, you know, do better. Yeah. I hope, <laughs> I hope I do better. Well, you, you have a, you know why it is. Right. Yeah. Right. It, it, yeah. It's, I think that's the, the part yeah. is you can, you can have an intuitive uh, understanding, but then when you have the why, I think that gives you a set of tools that now you can work with it. And yeah, yeah, it's, it puts that extra dimension on it. Yes. Right. Or if you're having trouble with something and you can't figure out what is, you have those tools to say, this is why it's not working. Yeah. You know, yep. or this is why it is working, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. It can, so. can help you get out of a spot. That's just not. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. That's yeah. not, yeah. Where, you know, a hump spot. And that's why a lot of times, like I have to put something down and walk away from it for a while. Mm-hmm. sometimes a day, a week, a month, you know, so the design process can be as immediate as 24 hours, or it can take me months to work through a design. Yeah. You know, that's interesting how that is, is the case in just about everything is that, yeah, yeah. Some things are pretty automatic and all right, that's it. I got it. But yeah, so yeah. many of them, all right, I think I have it, but I gotta, I'm too close to it. I have to walk away. I have to come back with fresh eyes. And, right. Yeah. And so you just set it aside and forget about it. And right. Yep. Yeah, then you come back and you go, all right, all but this right over here. This needs it. This needs a <laughs> something. Yeah. Right. And sometimes that's hard because you get wrapped up in one little element of the design and you love it, mm-hmm. but it may not actually be. It helping. needs to go away. <laughs> yeah, it needs to go away. You know, it's like, um, 
it doesn't belong in this design. You love it, but maybe it belongs in something else. Yep. You know, <laughs> so hold on to it, but it can't go here. Yeah. You know. <laughs> well, and, and reaching that conclusion can be really tough. Yeah. 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 And, and I think, um, you know, another thing that happens in design school is you have, or I had to go through, a, you know, usually you have a critique, you'll work on a, you'll be working on an assignment or a project. And then you have to kind of show your progress to the class and they're allowed to critique it. Mm. Mm. And that can be brutal, oh, yeah. absolutely brutal, but it can also be very constructive and help you leap some hurdles in the design process because mm -hmm. somebody else is going to look at it with totally different eyes right. than, than you're looking at it. And they aren't nearly as close to it emotionally either. Right. So, yeah. 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 In many cases, simply don't care. So, yeah. Right. Which is, I really which, don't care if yeah. you get an A on this project or not. But, but that, but that's a pot. Yeah. Done correctly. That's a positive. Yeah. Yes. Yes, absolutely. I don't care. Absolutely. And so therefore this is what I see and <laughs> it's not working. Yeah. <laughs> right. 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 Because or, or, they or brilliantly invested. done, you know? Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. And it's really nice to get a brilliantly done in a design review. So. Yeah, I'm sure of that. <laughs> yep. So, so take me through the process here before we run out of time. Uh, constant sketches, um, stitch before you chart, chart before you stitch. How, what, what is your process? Oh, absolutely. Chart before I stitch. Okay. Um, and yeah, I, I usually have, uh, I try to always have some kind of sketchbook with me, but a lot of times I don't. So, for one reason or another. So a lot of times it's on the back of receipts that get saved, uh, uh ch church bulletins, um, you know, <laughs> in my Bible sometimes, oh, <laughs> um, you know, stuff like that, that, um, I go back to, I do have a sketchbook that I've kept over the years and done work in. And so I have gone back to really old stuff and, and pulled from it. And, mm -hmm. you know, because if it's just an idea, you know, if I want to do something with a bunny, well, I, oh, I sketched a bunny way back when, uh -huh. let me go look at that. And then you pull it out and you go, okay, what can I do with this bunny? And you start working with it and suddenly it flushes out into a design. So you know, I take it from a very rudimentary sketch into more of a drawing. And sometimes I can get what I want pretty quickly. And then I take my, I still work old school, probably because that's the way I was trained. I get my vellum graph paper out and I lay oh it my. on top of my drawing. <laughs> and I'm, and I, and it's part of the process for me. Yeah. It's part of the thinking process for me. And so then I start, I'm just going around the outline, sort of pixelizing it because mm -hmm. um, I don't know if you notice, I use a lot of curves in my work. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. And not a lot of straight lines, which can be very difficult when you're pixelizing it. Right. <laughs> and, and so, um, I get that figured out and then I start figuring out where the color goes. And I usually um, am working, you know, I have a color drawing. And so about then is when I pull my threads and start figuring out what thread is it that I'm in, I'm visualizing with this color that I've used on the paper, Yeah, mm -hmm. you know, what translates and do I want it to be a flat? just flat dyed color, you know, like a DMC, or do I want it to have a little more depth like you would if you were coloring with a crayon? Mm -hmm. um, and so then I go to an over dyed floss or something like that. And I will use, you know, and then I put together my thread palette at that point and start figuring out where everything goes. And then I go to the computer and, and put it all in the computer. Yeah. And somewhere in there, I've also figured out what cloth I want to use. I typically 
go toward like I love raw cashew linen mm-hmm. and I I like even weaves, you know. So um usually a Lugana or a Monaco, something mm-hmm. like that. And sometimes color fabric and sometimes more of a neutral. Yeah. Yeah, well that's just it. These days there's all those options so you can really a play back and forth until yeah. you get the combination that really sings to you. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. So. I, and I think I can say this cause I'm pretty sure our pastor demographic is quite small, but uh, church is a great place for ideas, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> like in this sermon, I got to go home. I got, <laughs> I got an idea. <laughs> right. Right. You know, or um, I think we were not long ago that, the pastor was teaching on Peter walking on the water and I drew this little boat with the wind and I'm like, Oh, Oh, I think I need to go work on this. <laughs> oh yeah. What was he saying? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> My husband's elbowing me in the ribs, you know? And yeah. Yep. So yeah. The anyhow. mind opens up at times in the church. Yes. Yeah. 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 Well, I think it's a good place. A lot of times you sit and you're a lot more reflective. So yes. there's an opportunity to actually let things work out a little bit. Yep. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Nope. Happened to me a lot. Yeah. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yep. And obviously to me. <laughs> yep. Well, it's, uh, well, it, and it isn't just church. I mean, it's that kind of no. environment where you just, you get to put your mind in neutral and, and right. Then, uh, there's little inspirations that then start triggering things. And yeah, yeah. actually substitute teaching a lot of times can be the same thing, depending on the grade level I'm in, oh. you know, <laughs> you know, I, I always bring a sketchbook uh-huh. when I'm subbing because I'll walk into a classroom and I'll see a piece of student art oh. and I'll be inspired by that to do something. Or maybe I'm reading a story to the kids that inspires me or something like that. And getting a quick sketch or at least writing down a word Mm -hmm. is really important, you know? Yep. So, um, obviously at the younger grades, not as big an opportunity, (laughs) but (laughs) keep things moving. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) Do not let them get distracted. No, (laughs) you'll never get them back. (laughs) Right. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Cindy, anyway. yeah, I've enjoyed this. Thank you so much. Oh, good. Yeah. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. A lot of fun. A lot of fun. Love your designs, yeah. too. Yep. Well, thank you very much. Good thank stuff. Thank you. All right. Well, I, yeah, I, we got to stop. I got more oh, questions, God. so you know we'll have to have you back again. But um, Oh, I would love that. Yeah. I would love that. Got to stop. So, all right. Okay. Thanks to uh, Susan at uh, Fire Poppies for sponsoring. And Cindy, thanks. Really enjoyed it. Thank you.